Hello, I'm Dr. Peter Allen. Most days I am a scientist, but on the weekends I like to read science fiction and drink cocktails. Today I am reading Dune and drinking this blue and blue spice cocktail. So I've tried to invent a cocktail inspired by the themes and sensations of Dune. So I've made a spiced tequila sour. This is blue agave silver tequila inspired by the desert landscape of Arrakis, one and a half ounces. 0.75 ounces of ginger syrup for the spice. 0.75 ounces of lemon juice. Just a few dashes of cinnamon bitters because melange is said to smell like cinnamon. Add a rock and a bar spoon of blue curacao to your glass to represent the blue and blue eyes of the Fremen. And top that with your drink. I actually think that looks gorgeous and tastes delicious. Now my experience of Dune is this. It is a hyper-exaggerated sci-fi epic version of growing up, taking mind-enhancing substances to fuel one's ambition, and ultimately becoming the main character in one's own life. With that, let's move to part one. Dune. Coming of age, but on the galactic scale. Frank Herbert published Dune in 1965. It is one of the first in fact, the first on the very short list of books that won both the Hugo and Nebula Awards. Fun fact about me, I attended the University of Washington, which is also where Frank Herbert went to school. Now, the book has a deeply ecological perspective. Ecology was a relatively new bioscience discipline at the time, uh, and it came to be very influential. Dune takes place on the desert planet of Arrakis. The ecosystem of the imaginary planet is complex and carefully thought out. What's more, the political ecosystem and balance of power in this imaginary galactic empire was given careful thought. Characters have plans and contingencies all dependent on each other. Faints within faints, as the book puts it. Now, some characters in Dune are deeply aware of this complexity and even try to influence it. In keeping with the ecological theme, the changes tend to be long term and small interventions that add up to bigger changes. So Dune, in addition to being a galactic epic, is a coming-of-age story about Paul Atreides, the son of a powerful duke in the galactic empire. Paul starts as an intelligent and talented youth. He moves through a great metamorphosis, his genes, his childhood training, and a powerful drug called the Spice, Melange, all combine to give him a chance to reach his vast potential and become a super-being known as the Kwisatz Haderach. Now, Paul also becomes a messianic figure to the Fremen, the native people of Dune. In the book, he is very explicitly a false messiah. The Fremen people were tricked by centuries of propaganda. They were primed and made up prophecies. It's all lies and deception. The prophecies are vague words about likely events, statistically probable scenarios, known psychological archetypes, and when Paul and his mother are in trouble, they happen to know about this pre-planned propaganda, so they take advantage of the confluence of events and get the Fremen to help them. Now, I won't spoil the plot any further. If you want careful analyses of Dune, I recommend Quinn's ideas. He makes excellent videos about the Dune universe. For our purposes, suffice it to say that this novel, Dune, takes ideas to huge extremes. Just growing up becomes awakening godlike powers. Different styles of leadership become slave masters versus cult leaders. Political power brokers become human supercomputers with psychic witches. But I want to focus on the key to the Dune universe. The drug that extends life and makes it possible to navigate among the stars. Drug that increases cognition and expands awareness. The lifeblood of the Galactic Empire. The spice melange. Part 2, The Prosaic Spice in Real Life, Neotropics. Now, I'm not a medical doctor. This is not medical advice. My PhD is in analytical chemistry, so if you want to explore any of this, I recommend you talk to a physician to examine the risks. When I read Dune at 15, I thought, you yeah, know, maybe I could be the Kwisatz Haderach. All I need is some brain training, like a PhD program, and some brain-enhancing chemistry. And I don't know, maybe I can bend space and time and crush my enemies with the psychic force of my mind. The details were fuzzy. I don't I didn't conquer the Galactic Empire, but maybe that's just because I didn't have any LSD. 
the PhD program was great, by the way. Uh, the only superpower I got was the ability to cope with long-term stints of failed experiments, but I didn't do any drugs in college, so maybe that's why. Maybe I missed out on some mind-bending experiences. The greatest influences on the mental performance, in my experience anyway, are the basics. Getting enough sleep and water and maybe taking a walk regularly. You could be the Kwisatz Sadrach, the super being. What must I do? Lots of drugs? Fat rails of spice off a sandworm? Just drink water and get enough sleep, you dingus. Uh, if you're not familiar with that silly clip, uh, that was me playing with footage from David Lynch's Dune, 1984. This video should come out about a week before the new Dune. I anticipate it will be much better. If you haven't seen the 1984 version, maybe give it a pass. Or at least read the book first. The old movie follows the plot of the book, like very roughly, but misses really important points, like how the messianic prophecies are totally fake. Another issue is that Paul's 15 in the book, but he's played by a 25 year old in the 1984 film, and nothing else has changed about his character, and that makes him less credible as a mental giant. The villains are all deformed, but also sexy, which gives everything a really weird vibe. Eyebrows are often missing entirely. Other times they are practically their own characters. And there's lots of whispered, dramatic, internal monologue exposition, which is irritating. And there are va just baffling clown shoes additions like poisoning a guy and making him milk, like milk a cat for the antidote. Also something called a heart plug, which is, if anything, more gross than it sounds. None of that is in the book. But the spice is one thing that even the 1984 movie kept in. In the Dune universe, the spice must flow, and everything else, imperial power, atomic warfare, blood feuds, comes second. If you just finished the Dune novel, and that inspired you to try to get your hands on the spice and enhance your mind, you're probably looking for something called a nootropic. Nootropics are substances that have been claimed to help your brain work better. People buy them in the hopes of improving their thinking, their memory, creativity, or motivation. And you can go on Amazon and order any number of products that make these claims. And what do I know? Maybe they'll work for you. Uh, maybe they'll do what the Spice did for Paul Atreides. But I'm going to predict that these supplements will be disappointing. If they were very potent, they'd be regulated by the FDA. Part 2A, Legal Nootropics regulated by the FDA. Legal over-the-counter products that are regulated by the FDA with nootropic potential. I do know of three legal substances available over-the-counter that could be used to enhance mental performance under specific circumstances. Now, those are caffeine, pseudofedrin, and nicotine. All of these have significant risks, but here's the advantage of actual FDA-regulated products. You can be confident that these products are pure, that they're safe, in, relatively speaking, and that they really do actually do something. Unregulated supplements have no such guarantees. Caffeine, pseudoephedrine, and nicotine are stimulants. They could be used purely hypothetically to enhance cognition a little for a short time. Caffeine, for instance, could be used to stave off fatigue and boredom. I used to drink a pot of coffee a day, but I slowed down in recent years. Now I take 100 milligrams of caffeine about a half an hour before I get up in the morning. I'm one of those people who always wakes up more tired than when I went to bed. So taking a little caffeine to help me in the morning eases the transition from waking. I cut down on coffee to compensate, so I'm not taking a lot of caffeine or no more than usual. But let me be clear that taking caffeine is no substitute for sleep. Optimal thinking definitely means getting enough sleep. A pseudoephedrine, especially in combination with caffeine, can produce a more jittery feeling, but also an obsessive mental state for some people. And that could, again, hypothetically, help some people get brain work done. Uh, it's tightly controlled in the United States, so you have to get it at the pharmacy counter, you have to show ID, and there are limits to how much you can buy. It's used in the manufacture of illicit methamphetamines, so, yeah. Buyer beware. Nicotine is a very strange drug, and it's available in tobacco products, obviously vape pens, tobacco cessation products like nicotine gum, mints, and patches. Nicotine has some serious health effects, including heart and lung problems. At this point, as far as I can tell, nobody knows if non-tobacco products are safe in the longer term. 
but nicotine alone might increase the risk of heart attack. But hey, it also produces a mild buzzy feeling. So trade-off, I guess, heart attack, mild buzz. More importantly, as a nootropic, nicotine causes the brain to release dopamine. That dopamine rush reinforces habit formation, and that's why it's so addictive. A clever and disciplined person could, again, purely hypothetically, use safer sources of nicotine like mints or gums to rapidly build a healthy habit. A dopamine burst associated with studying, for instance, uh, could reinforce studying behavior. Now, those are OTC products that are known to be safe, at least in recommended dosages, and are neurobiologically active. But none are even close to the spice in terms of drama or effect. So what about supplements? Part 2B, supplements. Now, supplements are legal, but they are not regulated as drugs. Therefore, the marketing is basically whatever wild claims companies think they can get away with. Now, there have been cases where smart pills, so-called, have not even contained what it said on the bottle and occasionally even contained adulterants and drugs that were not listed. But on the positive side, at least a few such nootropic substances have actual placebo-controlled efficacy studies. Now, from my quick look over the research, most of those efficacy studies that were well run, you know, double blind, sample size more than 20, are treating diseases like Alzheimer's. Uh, there's no guarantee that a substance that does actually fight dementia is going to help a healthy person think better. And the effects are usually small in any case. You know, maybe as an aside, I should try one of those I tried neurotropic supplements for 30 days, here's what happened videos. So if you want to see me do that kind of thing, uh, leave me a comment or drop me a thumbs up and I'll, if there's an audience, I'll give it a try. And my hypothesis is that all of these supplements are going to have really small effects. Uh, and if they do happen to have a significant effect for one person, that's probably the result of that person's genes or the placebo effect. People have small biological differences, so there can be different effects from different substances. If a small minority do, in fact, get large benefits, this is actually statistically hard to prove. Uh, to make an analogy, imagine a sneezing powder made of peanut dust. For most people, totally ineffective, no more effective than plain old dust. But for a few people, if you happen to have a peanut allergy, it's debilitating. It'll produce a sneezing fit, maybe even an allergic reaction so severe they die. The average effect is small, but for the unlucky few, it's potent. So maybe some of these supplements are like that. They have a big effect for a few people, and that's why the effect looks small. This is where personalized medicine is actually a big deal. Someday we might correlate people's genes and their receptiveness to various substances. And then if you could know in advance that you were someone who would respond to the drug based on your DNA sequence data, then that drug would be more useful. It wouldn't be a small average effect, but a predictably large effect for a specific group of people. The effects of this fictional drug spice from Dune are also super dependent on genetics. For most of the Fremen, the people who live on Arrakis, there is some effect, but it's subtle. For Paul, the effect is magnified. In the story, he's the result of a long-term selective human breeding experiment. He has unique genes. His unique genes and his training come together such that the spice has a huge effect on his mind. It unlocks a prescient awareness extending down the many possible paths of the future. So I don't know, maybe there are some nootropic substances that'll really work for some people, but it's the Wild West out there. So, buyer beware. Part 2C, the black market. Probably the real life equivalent of the spice is lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD acid. Now, it's full-on illegal. I've never tried it, and I don't know if it's really comparable. But the drug was legal around the time the book was written. Academics were writing about its effects. The buzz about LSD probably inspired some of the effects of the spice in Dune. Uh, in The Science of Dune, edited by Kevin R. Grazier, the comparison of LSD and the spice is explicit, and so I'm not the first to make the comparison. Alas, the determination of any neotropic benefits of LSD, if any, were delayed by 40 years, thanks to the war on drugs. Uh, currently, there are some experiments in so-called microdosing. Uh, that's the practice of taking a tiny amount of drugs like LSD, not enough to experience any hallucinations, like trip balls, as the kids say. Maybe the kids say that. Just enough 
of the substance to affect the brain. And some people claim that microdosing LSD has some benefits. There are at least two lab studies that looked into the effect of microdosing on 20 people or so, and then maybe they saw some subtle effects, but nothing in terms of cognition thinking. Uh, Self-reported studies do report effects in both creativity and cognition, but self-reported studies are kind of problematic because people know that they're part of the experimental group and there's complications. In any case, without more research, larger studies, better controls, we're not going to know if LSD has any actual medical value. And it's really hard to do such research on illegal substances. There are a few studies going on that I'm always excited to read about, but LSD is on the Schedule 1 list of illegal drugs right alongside heroin. And so that makes all this kind of research very difficult. So I was curious why LSD was on that, if there are legitimate studies that seem to show it has some benefits. Uh, the dangers of heroin are certainly well known. People die every day of opiate overdoses. But what happened that inspired the decision to put LSD on the same list? A number of fatalities to LSD, even in the 60s when it was popular, were super small. So why make it illegal? Well, consider that Dune was written in the United States in the 1960s in LSD and the Hippies, a focused analysis of criminalization and persecution in the 60s, Miranda de Paolo writes, because of the increasingly negative media portrayal of LSD, public fears about LSD soared. The drug was classified as Schedule 1, which the DEA defines as drug substances or chemicals with no current accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. If the stipulations of this classification hold up in technical analysis, we can conclude the dangers of LSD were the legitimate cause for its criminalization. If these stipulations don't hold up, I maintain the reason for LSD's criminalization was to persecute and silence the hippies. Based on what I've read of the literature, there is clear evidence that LSD could be medically useful, so was outlying LSD really just silencing the hippies and the anti-war left? Well, Senator and then President Nixon's domestic policy chief, John Ehrlichman, was recently quoted as saying, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities, we could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. If that doesn't seem credible enough as evidence, consider this. The man who popularized LSD in the United States was Timothy Leary. Leary was running for governor of California in 1969 with popular support from John Lennon. Come Together was a Leary campaign song. He was then convicted of the possession of two marijuana roaches and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Michael Pollan seems to agree, and his book, how to Change Your Mind, The New Science of Psychedelics, uh, might actually be worth reading for if you want to explore this issue further. Okay, so if the spice was the galactic exaggerated version of LSD, what is it an analogy for? What Earth-scale superpowers will LSD get me, if I could get some? Well, in Peter Welch's memoir, And Then I Thought I Was a Fish, he takes some LSD and ends up thinking that he's a fish. So... That's not exactly a superpower. So no LSD for me, thanks. But I can get unregulated supplements on Amazon. So got that going for me, which is nice. Of all the things that we have talked about, I think LSD is probably the real life equivalent. Historically, that fits. Frank Herbert probably was inspired by reading about LSD uh, to write about it in the form of the spice melange. But do the effects fit? Will LSD open the doors of perception, make a person more creative, and enable them to do things that are meaningful and important, like fighting a galactic empire? From everything I've read, it can create the subjective feeling of importance, significance, and awe. People who take it often report that it was an important spiritual experience, so subjectively it might make a person feel like they have transcended time and space, and transformed into a greater being, and that certainly sounds like what goes on in Dune, but everything in Dune is exaggerated to the galactic scale. What's happening to the real person when they have this 
subjective induced metaphysical awakening. Maybe it's just perceiving themselves as the main character. Part three, main character syndrome. Here's a conversation that my wife and I had about main character syndrome that explains it better than I could on my own. What's that? It's the main character syndrome is when someone is convinced that they are the main character of their own story. Like a schizophrenic. <laughs> like a schizophrenic. <laughs> so they're... <laughs> but like a little less than that. Okay. So... Well, what's less? That's <laughs> what that is. So, uh, there have been documented cases where schizophrenic people have believed that they are in a reality TV show and that they are being secretly filmed and people are watching them, putting, putting them on some sort of show. Oh, that's scary. Yeah. Uh, it's like the Truman Show. They call it the Truman Show delusion. Oh. And, and that's, it's not a coincidence that after a bunch of reality TV shows like that and like the Truman Show came out Oh, that, you mean that movie with Jim Carrey? That's right. Okay. A a after that movie and other such media has come out, that's what was featured in people's delusional stories. 30, 40 years ago, uh, it was aliens, and 20 years before that, it was the CIA. Like, whatever's in the media is going to be what people are going to build their delusions around. Oh, then why do people think they have powers? That's a really good question. I'm sorry, but has that been in the media? Well, y y yeah. Oh, like Avatar The Last Airbender, right? All guess. kinds of things, yeah. Ah, uh, uh, like the X-Men. Absolutely. Okay, that explains that one. So, and and supernatural powers have been in... Superman. Human stories even farther back, right? Got it. I imagine if you were growing up in... In a H ancient Norway, you would have, and you had like schizophrenia. The power of the gods. Yeah, you you imagine that you were Thor embodied or something. Like I'm you, sorry, but that would be tight. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, As maybe schizophrenia is not so bad. <laughs> you get to be Thor, man. Hell yeah, you get to be Thor. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess that's the why the. The main character syndrome is so enticing because you get to be someone else, be be a big deal, be important in a way that. that but aren't these kids as terrified that they're on TV? Yeah, so that's the difference I think between bona fide mental illness and delusion, like the Truman Show delusion, versus just main character syndrome, which isn't a real psychological problem. It's oh it's just God. something that is being talked about on TikTok right now or something. Oh, are you serious? Okay, don't fuck with me. I thought this was a thing that schizophrenics have. Yeah, it probably is, but I don't know. All I know is oh. I've read about this. Oh, I see. People think they're the main character in their own lives because they're on TikTok. Yeah, that's oh, a good point. they're idiots. They're not schizophrenics. <laughs> oh, that's mean. <laughs> okay, right. We all, so in my experience, right, like, I am the main character of my own subjective experience. Oh, well, isn't everybody then? Okay, thank you, because I figured that was true, but honestly, don't know. How could I know? I mean, everybody's a little self-centered then, I guess. I don't know how you could not be. Well, yeah, but I mean, the world doesn't revolve around you, right? I hope right. you don't think that. No, no, I just... From what other perspective would I write my own story? Um, yeah, I, I, your own story, I guess. You wouldn't. You wouldn't write your own story from another perspective. That'd be weird. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. Are you thinking of writing your own story? Well, I think we kind of have to as a matter of how to live. Oh, I thought you were an autobiography. So here's a question. Is it a life better lived to consciously consider what your autobiography should look like? Or is it a life better lived to go with the flow and just be? Go with the flow, YOLO. Got it. TikTok trend again. No, no TikTok. You don't want to be a TikTok star? No, God no. That kind of talk, you sound like you, sound like you could do all right. 
No, that sounds horrible. That's a nightmare. People will watch me. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, I'll be watched for reals. That'll be that's real reality TV show shit. You're putting yourself out there. I know that's scary. I'm not doing that. Got it. Fair enough. If you're gonna you blow up, go viral, and then everybody like knows your face. Wants to see your feet. Um, that's when I sign off. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no feet pics. <laughs> I figure it's probably beneficial for people to regard themselves as the main character in their own life. Maybe not the main character in their friends' or family's lives, but taking responsibility for your own life is a good thing. Reading Dune is like imagining what it like must feel like to have the biggest delusion of grandeur ever. It's the teenager's self-importance except written across the face of the galaxy. And I admit it, I related to that at 15 because I wanted to be that important, and the desire was frustrated by, you know, reality, being 15. And maybe that's where the comparison of LSD to Spice breaks down. By many accounts, LSD enhances this feeling of profound meaning in ordinary circumstances. It makes the mundane feel magical and important. It's not a potion to make a person smarter or awaken their superpowers, if anything. It seems to help people just be more content with the story they're living in. And that seems like something worth cultivating, actually, whether we are, in fact, the main characters or not. Anyhow, if you like these long-form essays, I'm hoping to do more of them. If nothing else, you got a cocktail recipe out of it. Do turn in next time, and we will see you then. Well, if you liked that, uh, I hope you'll uh, forgive me for including a little blooper reel here. I also tried to make a... <laughs> blue red bull blue edition red bull and tequila cocktail with a little cinnamon bitters to keep with the theme of the blue and blue eyes of the fremen and the spice and it didn't turn out blue at all it turned out purple blue curacao did not help and when all was said and done ooh, i mean it's it's tough yeah that's not my bag but uh anyway like and subscribe <laughs>